I'm here to share with you a little bit about my story. I'm, I'm a mom, I'm a former teacher, and now I'm a safety advocate, a school safety advocate. And I spend a lot of time with this question here. Is our school safe? Is it safe to send my kids in? Um, a, lot of a lot of parents, a lot of teachers, a lot of students and community members ask this question. It's a big question. Uh, it seems simple enough, right? Uh, but in this day and age, it's become quite a lot more complex. As I said, it's a question that I spend a lot of time with. When I was a student, uh, school safety, is my school safe? That really meant, is the playground safe? Um, is my stuff safe? Uh, is, is the room safe? Do, are we ready for fires? Do we do the fire drills that we're supposed to? And then when I became a teacher, it was about, wow, a whole other level of preparedness, making sure that I had a first aid kit stocked, that I knew all the plans and procedures that I needed to follow in case the worst should happen. I worried about graffiti and drug abuse. I worried about bullying. Uh, and then I became a parent. And the bar got raised even a little bit higher. I began to be worried about the same things and, and even more. Is my kid safe in school? Is the school bus safe? Are people being kind to my daughters? Three beautiful daughters. For all those reasons um, and all those questions, my family chose the town of Newtown to raise our family. When we moved to Connecticut from Maryland, uh, my oldest was four at the time, my second daughter was two, and my youngest child was a baby. We lived in Newtown for seven years, and on this morning, December 14th, 2012, Safety, sure, it was on my mind as I was sending my kids off to school, getting them ready like I did every day. Uh, but again, I had chosen this, this school, this town, this place. It had high test scores, it had low crime rates, and everybody knew everybody. It was a wonderful place for our family. So I was pretty comfortable that morning, getting my kids ready, feeding them breakfast, doing their hair, helping them brush their teeth, getting them dressed again and again, a couple times, I think, that morning for each of them, the girls. And I was really proud of myself. I got them all off to school uh, pretty uneventfully. I was on my own. My husband was already off at work, two and a half hours away. Uh, and I sat down on the couch, and I was ready to relax just for a few minutes before the day started, ready to eat my own breakfast. And then the phone began to ring. I checked the caller ID to see if I was going to bother to pick it up or not, and it said Town of Newtown. And usually when I saw that, it meant that school was calling, and they were calling to let me know that I had forgotten somebody's permission slip or backpack or lunchbox or glasses or something like that. So I'm ready to hear the sweet voice of one of my kids' beloved teachers that I know so well. And instead, I hear a recording. It's our superintendent of schools. And she says, all of our schools are in lockdown. There's been a shooting. That's all she said. I remember being stuck on that last word that she said, shooting. I couldn't really get around it. My mind started traveling back in time to stories on the news, uh, images, footage, film of tragedies like Columbine. I started to panic. I knew that I needed information if I was going to keep my cool. So I started calling the schools. I started with the school where my oldest daughter went to school. She was a fifth grader in town at our intermediate school. Of course, nobody answered, right? They were in lockdown. Nevertheless, I called the elementary school. I thought maybe somebody would pick up the phone there. But of course, nobody did. They were too busy doing exactly what they were supposed to be doing, focusing on the safety of the children and, and each other in the middle of a lockdown. What I would learn is that they were in the middle of so much more. Needing information, needing answers to so many questions in my mind, I decided I would head out into town. Brilliant. I think I grabbed a sweatshirt and my keys and I took off. And the plan was that I would just loop the town. It would be really easy to see where this supposed shooting was. I hadn't yet bought into the idea. I was still convinced that it must be some kind of misunderstanding or false alarm or 
some kind of miscommunication. But out on the road that morning, um, my car quickly became overtaken by response vehicles. Every color, every stripe, every siren that you can imagine. I remember dutifully pulling over, letting them pass by, and ultimately just filing in behind them. I realized pretty quickly where they were taking me. They were taking me to Sandy Hook School, where two of my daughters were. One a fourth grader, one a first grader. When we got to the school, we didn't really get to the school. We only got as far as the fire station, situated on the corner of the drive up to our school. It was as far as we could get because that whole drive was clogged with response vehicles and parents arriving and community members. I pulled my car uh, up as far as I could to a little patch of grass, pulled over and parked, kind of taking in the scene. And I remember as I turned my head, I saw something really amazing. I saw a line of kids evacuating from the school. So as a teacher, this meant that the school was safe enough that they could begin this offsite evacuation. This is a really good sign. Even better, the line that I was looking at was my fourth grade daughter's line. So at this point in time, I now knew that two of my three girls were safe. I had already passed the intermediate school, nothing was going on there. And here I am now at the firehouse just before our school and I see my second daughter. I don't remember how many people I knocked over to get to her that morning. But I got to her and I told her to head to the firehouse just like we'd practiced. In fact, these kids had practiced this lockdown several times a year. My daughter, this daughter was a fourth grader. She'd done this quite a few times. In fact, they had done this just about a week and a half before this day. So she went off pretty comfortable with her class pretty comfortable with the place that she was heading to, where she knew she would line up with her class and wait for me to come back. And I would begin a long walk that morning, from the firehouse to the school, up as far as I could get before it was blocked off, and back to the firehouse and back to the school. And I would repeat this walk for hours that morning, looking for my youngest child's class, waiting to see that they had evacuated, but they never did. On that walk, I learned an awful lot. I was listening to whispered conversations, radio chatter, every little bit and piece of information that I could get. I was learning what had happened at our school after I got my girls off safely to school. Just about a half an hour into the school day, when most of our, our kids at Sandy Hook were wrapping up their morning meeting, loud noises started ringing out in the front portion of the building. A 20-year-old male from our community, a community where there were high test scores and low crime rates, where everybody knew everybody, or so we thought, this man, drove to our school after killing his mother. And he carried out one of the deadliest attacks on a school in US history, ultimately killing 20 of our precious six and seven-year-olds and six of our beloved educators. I share this with you because I believe those children and teachers that we lost that day, and the many that survived, have left us all in a position of power. If we dare to look at what they experienced and what they can teach us, then we now have the ability to do something about it, to make sure that we are better prepared to prevent, respond to, and recover from any crisis in our school or community. We learned a tremendous amount from those kids and teachers, and one of the first things that I remember sticking out at me was Whatever those teachers and students did in that moment, was it was really based on instinct and what precious little training and experience they'd had. It wasn't a lot. It wasn't much to work with. But they did the best they could. In fact, many of them rose well above their training or what you would reasonably expect for somebody to be able to do in those circumstances. 
I remember thinking about the level of training, the level of preparedness, and wishing that we had given them so much more. Because for our children and teachers in the front portion of the school where the attacks were carried out, there wasn't time to think. There wasn't time to problem solve. There wasn't time to be creative and come up with a plan B and a plan C when plan A had failed miserably. Plan A, of course, for something horrible, unthinkable, like a shooting or an attack on our school, was lockdown, right? So we would hear the principal make an announcement, just like we'd practiced over the PA, and then everybody would know what to do. The first thing, of course, would be to lock the classroom doors. Well, our teachers were unable to do that in the front hallway in time. So already plan A had fallen apart, and they didn't have the training or the practice to quickly default to something else. They learned in an instant that even though they weren't trained for it, they weren't prepared for it, they didn't sign up for it, many students and teachers that day in the building, many staff members, many parent volunteers realized they had a new job. In the blink of an eye, they became first responders. Because it's not like it is on TV where disaster strikes, you pick up the phone, you call 911, and then the cavalry arrives instantly takes time. For us, it would be about four minutes before that cavalry could arrive after the first 911 call had been placed. And then it would take precious time for them to figure out how to make entry into the building and begin the rescue. So the true first responders, our students, our teachers, our staff members, were the least prepared that day. They realized very quickly as the attack was happening how critically important it was to secure their locations. They knew this much from their training. And I think a lot of times after a crisis, you hear people talking about what they were so grateful that they had or the one thing they wish they would have had. And nine times out of 10, it's something really simple. For most of our children and teachers in school that day, it was the ability to simply put a barrier between themselves and danger, to be able to lock the classroom door. It was something in our old 1950s style building that they just couldn't do quickly and easily. They weren't properly equipped or trained to do. So even though following tragedies, you hear a lot of big ideas, amazing innovations. I want you to remember something that our students and teachers taught us. Very often it's simple things that make all the difference. A piece of knowledge, a practiced action or behavior, a simple tool like a key or a tourniquet to tie off a bleeding wound. Simple things can make all the difference. We also learn to think very differently about communication. Our students and teachers couldn't do anything without information, right? Hearing these horrible sounds, lots of staff members came running in the direction of those sounds to try to figure out what was going on. Nobody was calling anything over the PA. Nobody could get to the PA. In most schools, there are two ways we learn about any kind of emergency or crisis going on. There's the fire alarm, right? We're pretty good at that. And then there's the PA system. Some schools have two-way radios, uh, push alerts, apps, different things like that. Most of our schools don't even have a cell signal. So for us that day, it became very clear how important it is to think about communication. How are we gonna even tell each other what's going on and that protective action is required? We had this amazing school, this amazing little town of Newtown and here at Sandy Hook, we had this culture of safety. This is a tweet from our beloved principal, safety first at Sandy Hook. It's a beautiful day for our annual evacuation drill. You can't see from this grainy little cell phone picture, but there's pride on each and every one of those faces. And they had every right to be proud. They were doing everything they knew to do. But you just don't know what you just don't know. 
There was so much more to school safety than ever occurred to any of us in Newtown. At the end of the day, the plan for something like what we suffered on December 14th, 2012, something unthinkable, something catastrophic, something disastrous, it was really not here. That's something you hear about in a community far, far away, some place you've never heard of. It's probably related to a bullying incident or some kind of something or other that can help us put our heads down on the pillow at night and think, we don't have to worry about that here. We're safe. We're doing everything we know to do. After we suffered that day and the many weeks and months and now years following, many of us came together to try to heal, to try to process, to try to find some way to make meaning of what had happened. For a lot of us, it was about finding a way to make a difference. And for a small group of us in town, it was about rethinking school safety. We had to begin thinking about sending our surviving children back to school. Can you imagine how difficult that is? after you have lost a child in a place that you knew was safe? We began asking tough questions. We began thinking about a new purpose. And together we formed Safe and Sound Schools, a nonprofit organization devoted to finding the best practices, resources, tools, and information for schools across the country to ensure safety, to develop, to plan for the best possible practices to make sure that school is a safe place to learn and grow. We got stuck on this question. I think we might be stuck on this question for a long time. Is our school safe? It's a big question. Depending on who you ask, you'll get a very different answer. Depending on where you live or who you are or what your perspective is. Are you a mom? Are you a student? Are you a police officer, a firefighter? Are you a teacher? Are you worried about drug safety, gang safety? Are you worried about any number of weather issues or natural disasters? What does safety mean to you? Until we can get to the bottom of what safety is and what safety means to all of us, it's pretty hard, it's pretty overwhelming, in fact, to wrap our heads around how we're gonna move forward in a meaningful way. So overwhelming, in fact, that when we started this journey five years ago, after the tragedy, learning from as many people as we possibly could out there in, in the field of safety, we realized how big and overwhelming this concept of school safety was. It was no longer about graffiti or, or theft or bullying like when I was a kid. It's so much more. So how do we wrap our arms around it? How do we make sure that we're covering all the bases, that we're really addressing every aspect of safety in our schools? How about we bring it all together? For us at Safe and Sound, it's about the big six. These are six essential components of creating a comprehensive approach to planning and developing safety for schools across the United States. Each and every one of these areas is a, is a field of its own, a science of its own, if you will. But each and every one of these comes together to support the safety of the school in a comprehensive fashion. There's some overlap, and there should be, because each of these areas is intertwined and connected when it comes to the safety of our schools and communities. We've got to have strong mental and behavioral health programming, resources, experts, and practitioners. We've got to have health and wellness programs, school nurses, nutrition, physical education. We've also got to have attention, strong attention to physical safety, crime prevention, crime prevention through environmental design, law enforcement, school resource officers, and any number of professionals that serve us in the area of physical safety and security climate and culture. It's important to think about how it even feels to be in school. Do you feel safe when you're there? Do you feel welcome? Are you comfortable enough to take risks and learn and grow as a student, a teacher, a volunteer, staff member? 
and community engagement essential for plugging people in to school safety. You know, when I was a teacher and when I was a stay-at-home mom, safety was important to me, but I really looked at it mostly as somebody else's job. The principals, the police, the firefighters, the emergency medical folks, school nurse, they've got it covered, right? I don't really need to focus, I don't really need to be that intimately involved in the plans in my school because it's somebody else's job. I learned too painfully that that's not the truth. Each and every one of us in the community have to be educated and have to be a part of making sure that it's safe. And of course, the cornerstone to everything we do in safety, emergency management, interagency operations, planning for recovery, for response, and for, res and for preparedness for a variety of circumstances and crises that may befall our communities and our schools. There's a wealth of knowledge in each and every one of these buckets, and all together, they form this comprehensive approach to school safety that we call the Big Six. I think bringing it all together is key to answering the problem. There are a lot of solutions out there for the safety of our schools. But I share with you my daughter, Joey, who died in the tragedy on December 14th, 2012 at Sandy Hook School with 19 of her friends and classmates and six of her beloved teachers. She was autistic and apraxic and loving and affectionate and truly brilliant. And one of her superpowers in this world, and I'm convinced everyone has at least one or two, but one of her superpowers was bringing people together. For a nonverbal child, she was pretty darn good at it. She had a way of bringing all kinds of people together, people that wouldn't normally spend time together, interact together, work together, and yet they did. So I take my cue from her and I invite you to do the same. As you rethink school safety, I ask you to think about how you can be a part of it, how you can help us accomplish successful development and planning for safety in our schools. I ask you to join all of us and work to make sure that our schools are as safe as possible. I know that together we can. Thank you. How can students be a part of this? I think if you're left out of it, if, if you're not involved in the conversation, if you're not invited to the table, you're anxious, you feel un underprepared, you feel out of the loop, and this is your house. You know, this is, this is where you live for most of your days, um, except for summer, which is coming up, thankfully. But it's important that you find a way in, and I understand how difficult that can be at times. Um, when we founded Safe and Sound Schools, we expected that we'd hear from a lot of moms and dads and a lot of teachers, naturally, a lot of police officers. What we really didn't anticipate was the tremendous response we got from young people. How can I be a part of this? I have questions, I have ideas, I, I wanna know how I can become involved. So we started working with a lot of students that were reaching out to us and we created a program called the Safe and Sound Youth Council. We designed it as a way to help you get to the table. You know, it's not always so easy to bring your ideas to the grown-ups in charge. Um, sometimes they're eager to hear them, sometimes they're busy, uh, sometimes you get kind of pushed aside. And so we designed this program to be something that you can form as a high school or middle school club, get it started with school leaders here that you have um, that will support you, and help you design your own programs, your own projects to incorporate you into the work of creating a safer school community. So if you check it out online, it's free, all of our programs are. Um, you can find a whole menu of different projects that you can get started on that, that really do have an amazing uh, impact on the safety of your school and also give you a sense of empowerment, a sense of control, and help you become more educated about school safety and obviously less anxious. Thank you.
I think probably the biggest lesson for most of us is that if it could happen in a sweet little elementary school in a sleepy little New England town, it, it really could happen anywhere. Um, we are living in an uncertain world, and it's our job to do the best we can to keep ourselves safe and the people around us safe. But it's not always easy. It's not something we can turn away from. It's not something in this day and age I think that we have the luxury to turn away from. So I think that's probably the, the biggest takeaway for society in general. But immediately following the tragedy, uh, law enforcement folks uh, stepped up, started looking at how they were responding. Um, emergency medical people, fire, firefighters, uh, emergency managers, all those people in that, that cornerstone uh, box there that, that belong in that emergency management category or component of school safety. They were among the first to start pushing up their sleeves and we really took the lead from them. Um, sometimes it's hard to get change going in the field of education, but with good leadership, with solid practices to, to learn from, I think we've seen a really, a really steady increase in participation, you know, not just those emergency managers, those fire folks, police, emergency medical people, that all those people that you would expect to be focused on safety and, and working on it um, even harder now but now students and teachers and parents, um, community members, all, all different types of people that we see joining in and, and pushing up their sleeves as well. You know, I think when my family was moving, um, you know, all the kids were so young and we were thinking about where to go, that, that question was on my mind. Where's the best place? Where's the safest place? Where's the most ideal place uh, that we can plant our family. And we, we chose this, this little, you know, hamlet um, pretty far outside of the city because I figured if it's more rural, um, at least we'll be away from, from some of the, the, you know, crime, some of the, the traffic, some of the, um, the busyness that we were used to um, in the Baltimore, Washington metropolitan area. Uh, but I think the truth is, Wherever we go, there are different factors that we have to be looking at. Uh, so if we're looking at um, San Francisco, if we're looking at Florida, if we're looking at Texas, you know, if we're looking at uh, any number of different locations, we have to be thinking about safety specifically, thinking about natural hazards, thinking about threats of violence, thinking about mental health, thinking about all those components. So I really do believe that whether it's rural or urban, uh, suburban, whether it's a wealthy community um, or a struggling community, we do have the ability to make the best of, of our circumstances as long as we are looking through that lens and making sure that we're focused on safety in a very comprehensive approach. Um, I, I think where you feel safe, where you feel welcome, where you feel free enough to grow and develop and learn into the person that we all know that you can be, that's where you need to be. And you need to, you need to work together and be a part of making sure that it's as safe as possible, wherever it is.